Right, Matthew, do you want to just tell us how this happened? Um, uh, a bit of a backstory before we get and talk about your career and BAE? I grew up uh, in the country, country Victoria um, in the days, uh, on the border between South Australia and, uh, and uh, Victoria, um, near a place called Caniva. When I was young, when I was two and a half years old, uh, my father had been working on the farm all day and he came home into the yard, was dealing with some grain and a uh, grain auger and we were playing in that with that grain auger and my hands basically got caught uh, in, the, in the bottom. Um, and so both arms got cut off and that was it, they were gone. For me, I was a kid, I just grew up, I feel like I grew up normally. I never really had an expectation that um, I was different to anybody else. I just used to try and find ways to do things that were, were different. Uh, when did you get the interest in the skiing? Because I think people are interested to, be, to hear how far you went with that. Skiing started when I was in grade six, just with a school camp, and I quite liked that. And then sort of that continued on to when I was uh, in my sort of early 20s, just starting work. Uh, I went to a, a ski sale and there were some disabled Paralympians there and they said, why don't you come and ski with us? So, so I did and um, ended up going through to the Paralympics, which was really good. Which Paralympics did you get to? I went to the 1998 uh, Games in Nagano, Japan. So um, that was, um, it was quite, quite interesting and quite an interesting time for me. When I went to the Paralympics, first time I saw a lot of disabled people and I didn't realise before that that you know, there, were, there were people there without arms as well, but they didn't do things like I did. They did them differently. Um, depending on when they sustained their, their, um, their, their injury, I suppose. Um, so for me, um, you've seen me, you know I can type with my feet and do everything with my feet. They couldn't, they were um, quite you know, impacted, so they, they couldn't necessarily even use a knife and fork. Whereas Andy, you've seen me use chopsticks. Um, I have, um, chopsticks um, with so, your feet, it was pretty so, impressive. So, it must um, impressed everyone else in the restaurant, I remember them all watching. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So, so it just depends on, uh, I think it depends on when you sustain the accident. Mm. Um, so having it happen early, I've learnt to do a lot of things. And so what about when you got to university and, and then into the work environment? Look, there were challenges. The, the, the one thing that really um, was difficult for me, that I didn't really anticipate, was moving into the workforce from university. So for example, when I got to the end of university, like everybody else, I applied for uh, jobs with the large accounting firms because I thought I wanted to work for the large accounting firms. At the time there was eight of them. I got interviews to a lot of them but um, when I went to the interviews I noticed they weren't particularly interested and um, uh, some of them would even just look out the window while they were asking me questions. I'd read through the questions and they'd look out the window. And um, then I went, didn't get a job offer from any of them and then I went for the, job, uh, for the jobs with the second tier accounting firms and one of the partners there called me back for a second, second, I thought it was a second interview. So I came back and I sat down with him in, in, in the room and basically he said to me, Matthew, he goes, I'm just gonna give you some advice. He says, I think you're a bit green and you don't understand what's going on. But he said, I wanna give you some, some advice as to what you need to do. And what he said was, he said, look, nobody's gonna employ you because you haven't got, any, haven't got any hands. And he said, the reason is because we have 600 applicants for every position, every job we advertise. He said, so we don't have to take the chance that you won't work out. So he said, so we won't take it. And he said, as long as we don't tell you that um, your disability is the reason why we're not employing you, we don't have a problem. So he said, that's the way, that's the way it works. So he said, look, apply to the Australian Taxation Office. He said, he said, they will take you, they will want you, they'll see it as a positive. He said, you know, your results and everything, they'll be very interested. So to be honest, I was a bit shocked by that, but I thought about it and I thought perhaps he was right. I was already in a process with the ATO and I reckon within a month that offered me a job and, and I started there. So when you interviewed for BAE, what were you thinking? Were you concerned about anything when you uh, um, responded to our advert? Yeah, I was. Because, because as a person with a disability, every time you apply for a new job, you're worried about what the person who is interviewing you is thinking. As in, are they thinking this person will not be able to do the job because, let's face it Andy, I don't have any hands. So how am I gonna type? How am I gonna communicate? What was interesting is I didn't 
no, actually. So when someone, you always, before the interview, you ask and you say, anything I should know? Uh, and I can't remember who it was. They said, I think you need special headphones. My recollection was that I asked you, that I said to you, Andy, do you have any concerns around the fact that I don't have any hands? And the reason I did that is because you hadn't brought it up. Now, I, I know that you, you couldn't, but... I no. had noticed. <laughs> but, yeah, you had noticed, yeah. But do you remember what you said? I can't remember. It's three or four years ago now. What you, what you said was you said, well, you've had a career for 14 years in the tax office. You've had a career for 13 years at Ernst & Young. So if there was a problem, I think they would have worked that out already. So it's not a consideration. You obviously weren't prepared for that question at the time. Um, so I thought that was a pretty good answer. Matthew, could you talk to us a little bit more about your role as the head of tax for Australia? Um, my role is, is the head of tax, which means I'm responsible for all the tax aspects across Australia that, that occur with BAE. Um, my role also is to engage with the UK team and support the tax function globally. It's effectively an outposted group tax function. Uh, so it's important we coordinate and we support the business everywhere. My disability doesn't really affect that. You know, I might be a little bit slower at typing, but not, not totally slow. Um, apart from that, I work around it. I tend to arrange my work in ways that probably enable me to do more verbally than type everything out, but that seems to work okay. So Matthew, often when we look at hiring people with physical disability, we, we try to think of everything that we need to do, uh, and then it becomes too big a project, and we, we say, oh, it's too difficult, and I won't do it. What could we do as a company to make it easy to employ people with physical disabilities, to give them that first chance uh, in employment? I think the, the most important thing is that we get them in the door. So it's a process of making that easy for them. And then once they are in the door, we solve all the problems that they have. The problems with ramps, the problems with braille on doors, the problems with equipment that they might need. We're an engineering company, we can do that. We can, we can solve those problems. It's just a matter of being flexible and being quick to do stuff, taking the barriers down. You talked there about it being an engineering problem. Um, have you got any examples of where it's been treated as an engineering problem for something that you wanted to do and how it's just been fixed by engineers finding a way? For me, um, probably the best example I have of that is back in my days at university. I always wanted to be a pilot, always liked the idea of flying. Um, you know, that was something I probably used to dream about. When I got to university, there was a um, gliding club at, at Adelaide University. So I actually walked up to the guys at the gliding club. They had a glider sitting there on the, on the lawns. And I said to them, hey, can I fly that? And, and they kind of looked at me and they took me over to the glider and they sat me in it and they went, yep, you'll be able to fly that. And the thing was, Adelaide University Gliding Club was filled with engineers, always has been. Mm. And these guys were all engineers. And I worked out later that all they did was they looked at me as an engineering problem. They were looking at me going, okay, we can make a, a slight change to the glider here or there, and we can put this here and put this different lever in. We can solve the problem, he can fly. And they did that. They got, they got me to the point of flying by myself. If there's one thing you could say to people when they first meet you, to sort of help put them at ease or help them understand some of those challenges, what, what would you say to them? What I would say to them is um, every person is a person and, and you need to treat them like a person. If you were unfortunately injured on the way home from work tonight and you lost the use of your legs, what would prevent you from continuing your work and continuing to contribute like you did now? Sure, there'd be more challenges, but my answer is I don't think there's anything because most of us, um, those of us who are in office type jobs in particular, we are just simply, it's mainly, our, we're just simply using our minds. Mm. And, and that is the critical thing. And it's how we get the information out of our minds and convey that to other people. That's the majority of what we do. So the loss of the use of an arm, the loss of the use of a leg, um, there are many other disabilities uh, that wouldn't impact your ability to do your job. And, and just helping people do that is what I think would be the message that I would give people as to what I'd ask them to do. The statistics kind of don't lie. There is a, there is a gap here, and it's a gap where skills in the economy aren't being picked up. And you know, we're at a situation where 
taking skills that are out there and using them in our organisation, if we can get benefit from, them, from it, we should. I think it's a no-brainer. It's like, it's the right thing to do for the business and it's the right thing to do for culture and for, for, from a personal perspective. We all know that there aren't reasons why some of this should happen and we're just used to it. And so we need to make some changes to, to benefit ourselves and benefit the community. I agree.